you were talking the other day, but I wonder if you could expand more on, uh, on uh, what is, it, is his name, Ibn Arabi, or, uh, and the, the I concept of, of a, a unique expression, you know, each person being in each sentient being, being a unique expression of, of the divine and sort of having their own unique um, experience, I guess, of, of that. And just, I, I just, you know, you, I just like you to talk a little bit more about that if that's possible. Good to see you, Andrew. Now, happy to talk about it been, or talk about this topic, this that you're asking about. Um, was there anything about it in particular that spoke to you or? Well, the whole thing speaks to me, I guess. And uh, I just, uh, I mean, I think it will be, my questions might become more clear as you talk about it, because in some sense, it's, you know, it's just about what he's saying and what, you know, it just, and what I'm thinking about it, maybe I'm trying to see where they overlap. You know? Okay, good. So, Ibn, Ibn Arabi, um, for the very same reasons often is considered by many, many people, many Sufis in particular, but many people, period, as the greatest mystic that ever lived, as, at least in Islam, if not ever, but in Islam for sure. Um, he's often called the Sheikh of Sheikhs or the Master of Masters. And for the same reason, he is called uh, the greatest heretic in Islam that ever lived, the worst of the worst, um, because of his teaching being so, striking so much to the heart of what it is to be and what God is. There's been so much written about Ibn Arabi and he has written so much and said so much. One of the things by a very respected person in Islam uh, that was said of Ibn Arabi is that anybody who pretends to understand what Ibn Arabi said is a liar. So let me start with that. <laughs> um, you can only really talk about what commentators have said about Ibn Arabi or what your particular take on what he said is. So you're getting the Krishna version, which is filtered through other mystics besides Ibn Arabi and other scholars and things. But for me, the reason that I repeat it or I talk about it at all is because it speaks so deeply, his words speak so deeply, the vision speaks so deeply to my own experience, so directly. And filled in a kind of gap that was there in terms of understanding and clarity between poles of experience, like big mystical experiences of mine that were very different, that didn't quite, I, I didn't see how they fit together. And it was almost like a note to self, I can't figure this out, but someday maybe somewhere there'll be some description or revelation that I'll come across that will address this. And um, those were experiences that I had when I was young as a, a Christian, as an evangelical Christian. Um, you know, I, when I left evangelical Christianity, I left behind so much of the dogmatic assertions and um, 
insistence on having the only truth and all of that and mo most of the claims, but I couldn't leave behind the mystic experience that happened to me at certain times in my life while I was an evangelical Christian, which were actually linchpins for me in terms of staying, even when it made no sense logically. Now, certainly I heard all the arguments about why it was just a crutch and irrational and, you know, just a weird thing to believe and arbitrary and all that, but the experience of synchronicities, the experience of answered prayer, the experience of more than just, oh, I pray and, oh, I kind of in the ballpark, something happened, but more of a sense that I was directly being followed by a presence or uh, I kept meeting a presence that not even a pre the presence was one thing, but I kept finding myself in situations that um, whose meaningfulness profound that were profoundly meaningful, and the meaningfulness had to do with the sense. that I was being uniquely communicated with by the universe, uniquely communicated with. Meaning what was unique about me, my mind, my thinking mind, my individual personness was being contacted by something larger than the means that were used to contact me. So what I mean is I, you know, examples is, you know, um, I pray that something be addressed and I'll just make up, everybody's had these experiences, the synchronicities, deep synchronicities. I would pray that, you know, something would be addressed very specific in my life that nobody else, very, very, it's not world peace. We're talking about you know, this person in school does this when they look at me and they have this thing and it irks me. You know, very specific to my personality, to my life, to what's going on. And then my mother turns on the radio in the car and one of the commercials say, does she annoy you <laughs> by, by that stupid grin? Well, blah, blah, blah. I mean, you know, it's like, what, how? This is weird. Am I psychotic? This is not. And of course, I'm not psychotic. Jesus is real. The Holy Spirit is speaking through the radio. I know darn well that the person making the commercial hasn't been talking to Jesus, or probably hasn't. It's somehow everything is being used to convey, or in that moment, I am aware of some, and, and the experience of hearing it and, and having it happen is bigger than the actual event. Like what it's unpacking is like, wait a minute, what, how is that possible? Well, the explanation was, you know, that the Holy Spirit was. And then later on, I realized that people in other traditions also had these experiences and people that weren't even in traditions had these experiences. And then, so that was like one thing that was kind of mind blowing. And I tried to, that's kind of, Quite honestly, when I found out that other traditions had experienced synchronicities, and the way that I found that out is by um, ingesting psychedelics and having the, because I, I left, I was out of the good graces of evangelical Christianity, and I did psychedelics, and then suddenly God was still willing to speak to me, even though I didn't believe that other stuff, or I wasn't doing it. I was like, how does that happen? There's still a connection. There's something happening. And then I began reading, starting with Be Here Now by Ram Dass and then other books, realized, oh, other people in the world, God communicates with them that way. 
later on when I started, because I was open now to Eastern traditions, I began to understand non-duality and Advaita Vedanta and Zen. But one of the ways, uh, one of the key elements of that was having to let go of mind so that you recognize what makes us one. Because I was going, okay, we're one, obviously, because everybody has these synchronicities. So that got me in the door. But then the deeper I went into Eastern spirituality, it was obvious what we were one in, how we were one, was not through our individual bodies, but somehow the ground of being is in what is how we were one that which transcends the senses is how we are one that which transcends our mind and categories of mind like all of our thoughts separate us from each other because they give us a unique opinion that nobody else has and so that creates a sense of duality, each person with their own opinion. Also, the sense fields, we're seeing everything through the sense fields. So, and we're experiencing through the sense fields. And we all have our unique bodies that are the base of those senses. So therefore, bodily experience is not non-duality. Bodily experience actually is the foundation, along with mind, of duality. Therefore, you know, and you've heard of this neti neti, not the body, not the mind, not the emotion, the awareness of the body, the awareness of the mind, the awareness of emotions has no content. It's not an I, because I is again, a thought or a feeling arising in the awareness. So that pure awareness, which is, you know, either called intrinsic awareness or Buddha nature or in Hinduism or Advaita, capital S self or Atman. That is free of content. And that is the basis of what I am. It's the basis of what we are it's who we are ultimately because everything else changes so that's the basis of our non-duality that is the way in which we're not separate okay so that became a whole thing for me that became my experience in satsang well starting with ken russell and then going through all kinds of other teachers zen and um tibetan buddhism and then Advaita Vedanta with Papaji. Clarity around that was a relinquishing, you could say, of the individuality of body and mind. Because the individuality is the basis of, the, of our separateness. So that still didn't make any sense of the synchronicities, quite honestly. Because the synchronicities that I had had earlier as a Christian even though that was the thread through which I got into mystic thought or mystic experience, that whole synchronicity thing is based on the senses. Somebody talking to me, there's a me. And now I'm going, I deconstructed that me, there's no me. And that there's no actual un unity through the me and the body and what's arising in the senses. So, there was an insurmountable gap between non-separateness, which synchronicity seemed to be saying was true, and the experience of emptiness, or uh, and, the, and the experience of, uh, yeah, anyway, those two. <laughs> those two. The means and with the way in which we are one is the way in which we're nobody. And so, you know, the teachings in Buddhism uh, of emptiness, 
and of the illusion of the personal individual self and even the illusion of any phenomenal objects being um, inherently existing in any way. Basically said, don't bother paying attention there. Don't bother looking there. Don't bother giving that a lot of juice because that's the way of delusion. That's the way of further separateness. So I was like, well, how does this synchronicity thing kind of come together? How could God, who is like the ultimate other, or some intelligence on the other side of the of my experience, of my world, understand my thoughts and connect, or what was happening there within phenomenality. So an essential part for me in this story, and I hope this is okay telling this story, I think it may be useful my personal experience, since we're talking about personal experiences, um, was getting involved with waking down and trillium, or what was known as waking down then, which the teaching was because it came out of Da Frijan, who came out of Muktananda. Uh, it was much more about the energy or the Shakti or the goddess or the stuff of life and saying yes, embracing that we as individuals are also real and not simply Maya. And that embrace got me curious, particularly about the roots of it, because um, having had the initiatory and um, for, you know, like a kind of further awakening into um, a kind of whole being realization or a further letting go, no longer just as consciousness, but now the energetic bodies, the subtle um, layers of being becoming enlivened and connecting with the um, apparent outside world of the senses, feeling that connectivity, which was a, a big piece of what happened in that whole being realization in waking down. Um, it was, I remember really distinctly when I was first considering what they were saying in, uh, in, in that teaching was, um, I was like, well, I, I'm consciousness itself and what they're describing sounds like an awakening happening within the dream, within in the delusion. You know, that an individual I is awakening to connecting with forms that don't actually really exist, that are in flux. The individual I doesn't really exist, it's in flux. And I was kind of hands off and saying, well, the momentum of the conditioning of believing there's an individual mind in an individual world that's unraveling itself. That was the teaching and advice of Vedanta. I'm not touching that because the more I let it unravel by leaving it alone, the more grounded I am or the more energy and attention is grounded in simply being the unconditioned awareness, which is peace, which is silence. And I like peace and silence. It feels good. It, now it's a kind of a contradiction here because feeling, of course, is in phenomenality. But it was also understood that that was the side effect of attention. So I like that side effect. And even apart from liking the side effect, it was reality. It is reality. That the only thing that is unmoving and unchanging is the silent, unmoving, unchanging space in which all the energies 
and phenomena are arising, taking forms and falling apart. And there's something about wanting to live in reality that was appealing. So I resisted quite a bit, Samuel Bonder and Waking Down and Ted Strauss and all of those guys, really did. I had a lot of conversations with them. Something about it attracted me though. The thing that attracted me was the really valid human relationships I saw, how people connected with each other, how people respected each other and respected each other's stories even. So that is what attracted me, but this teaching about the universe being real seemed like the price of admission to have this kind of compassion or mutual respect or mutuality. And I thought, you know, and also being still a Buddhist in some way, a big way, said, well, you know, that's uh, compassion. And wherever there's a teaching on compassion, I wanna develop that. And obviously it seems like a kind of realization that's in the dream that may be ultimately not even real, maybe just a phase, but I would like to have, see the validity of this by directly experiencing it. So I began to allow myself to feel all of the sensations, including limitations, and did not discount my story or anybody else's story about what was happening in my life. I stopped deconstructing just to have this experience and so it happened. I had this whole being realization. There's this sense. Later on, I could see, ah, I tracked back, like I was saying, through Muktananda, through Adi Da, because I had been very familiar with Da Free John's teachings. Muktananda, who was this huge fan and claimed, even though he was not trained in it, that Kashmir Shaivism or Advaita Tantra, rather than Advaita, uh, um, Advaita Vedanta, was actually descriptive of his, his transmission. That it was, he, like he basically stumbled onto, said, look, this is, these scriptures are really describing what I'm doing. And he told his students, Muktananda, to study Kashmir Shaivism, um, Trika, all of those traditions. And so later, I, you know, around 2002, I began submerging myself in everything I could read on Kashmir Shaivism, and saw that the transmission in Waking Down really was much more of a tantric transmission, which aw awakens this phenomenal body. So there I was with that. And it honored the individual experience that each of us experiences and a lot of what makes it possible to have the kind of compassion in mutuality that I saw in Waking Down and that I wanted was an honoring of the fact that everyone that I know at the level of their individuality, you could say at the level of manifestation is a sealed mystery to me. I will never know what it's like for, their, that for them to be them from their side. They will never know what it's like to be me from my side. Now that's true of all of the phenomenality, the soul nature, the energetic bodies, the, you could say the human nature, whatever grab bag you wanna to use to describe phenomenal life. In terms of consciousness itself, I know exactly what it's like for you to be consciousness itself. Because that is absolutely free of content. So that mystery of not knowing what it's like to be on the other side is this mystery of multiplicity arising and consciousness itself. And Ibn Arabi's teachings, when I came across them, 
suddenly, and actually the way I came across them was through a synchronicity. I was chewing on this very thing for quite a while. I mean, it would come round about often, but I, at the time when I d discovered or when, it, when Ibn Arabi was revealed to me in my life, I was like, somebody's got to address this somewhere. It's like the, I could tell people were just kind of beating around the bush because the non-dual people in the, in, in the East, there seemed to be assumptions, like Papaji told many stories of synchronicities. And there were many, many stories of people coming to Papaji to be with him that happened through synchronicities. I mean, it happened to me all the time. That was part of what was so powerful about him as a person. And yet, whenever he spoke, he would acknowledge those, but directly go to emptiness, to what's aware of all of that, rather than saying, wow, isn't that amazing that God is speaking to you? He would say, who is it that God is speaking to? And, and what is aware of that phenomena of being spoken to? So he would go right to what we would call the absolute, to the ground of being to, you could say, consciousness itself, or Prakash, or the Atman. So what does Ibn Arabi teach? I'm, I'm looking, I'm, I'm trying to figure out who addresses this? Where is there anyone who can address this? How could it be significant, synchronicities like this, What's the way in which we're connected? What's the way in which we're different? 